Check, check, check. Amen. Welcome once again to our Wednesday night Bible study here at Calvary Chapel. Thank you for all you brave souls braving the heat as the air conditioning is out. Uh, welcome to you watching online, even though you're not watching live because the Wi-Fi is down, but you will be getting the message shortly after we finish, and we will load it. So praise God for that. God's word continues to march forward no matter what the obstacle. Tonight, we continue our study through the book of Genesis, and tonight we are in Genesis chapter 37, verses 1 through 28. So if you'll turn there in your Bibles, you may follow along with me as I read. Genesis 37, starting in verse 1. Now Jacob dwelt in the land where his father was a stranger, in the land of Canaan. This is the history of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brothers, and the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives, and Joseph brought a bad report of them to his father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age. Also, he made him a tunic of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. Now Joseph had a dream, and he told it to his brothers, and they hated him even more. So he said to them, please hear this dream which I have dreamed. There we were, binding sheaves in the field. Then behold, my sheaf arose and also stood upright, and indeed your sheaves stood all around and bowed down to my sheaf. And his brother said to him, shall you indeed reign over us or shall you indeed have dominion over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Then he dreamed still another dream and told it to his brothers and said, look, I have dreamed another dream. And this time the sun, the moon and the 11 stars bowed down to me. So he told it to his father and his brothers and his father rebuked him and said to him, what is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall your mother and I and your brothers indeed come to bow down to the earth before you? And his brothers envied him, but his father kept the matter in mind. Then his brothers went to feed their father's flock in Shechem, and Israel said to Joseph, Are not your brothers feeding the flock in Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. So he said to him, Here I am. Then he said to him, please go and see if it is well with your brothers and well with the flocks and bring back word to me. So he sent him out of the valley of Hebron and he went to Shechem. Now a certain man found him and there he was wandering in the field and the man asked him saying, what are you seeking? So he said, I'm seeking my brothers. Please tell me where they are feeding their flocks. And the man said, they have departed from here for I heard them say, let's go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them in Dothan. Now when they saw him afar off, even before he came near them, they conspired against him to kill him. Then they said to one another, look, this dreamer is coming. Come, therefore, let us now kill him and cast him into some pit. And we shall see, and we shall say, some wild beast has devoured him. We shall see what will become of his dream. But Reuben heard it, and he delivered him out of their hands and said, Let us not kill him. And Reuben said to him, Shed no blood, but cast him into this pit, which is in the wilderness, and do not lay a hand on him, that he might deliver him out of their hands and bring him back to his father. So it came to pass when Joseph had come to his brothers that they stripped Joseph of his tunic, the tunic of many colors that was on him, they took him and cast him into a pit, and the pit was empty. There was no water in it. And they sat down to eat a meal. 
Then they lifted their eyes and looked, and there was a company of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels bearing spices, balm, and myrrh, on their way to carry them down to Egypt. So Judah said to his brothers, What profit is there if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come and let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother and our flesh. And his brothers listened. Then Midianite traders passed by, so the brothers pulled Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. And they took Joseph to Egypt. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again as we approach your word. We thank you, Lord, that we can gather in your name, Lord, and that we can hear from you, dear God, as you speak through me, God, with your spirit to us. So, Father, we ask that you will have your way, Lord God, as we surrender all that we are to you, Lord. Father, if there is any listening tonight that does not know you as Savior, I pray, Lord, that they would come into relation with you. And for all of the saints, dear God, that are here, worshiping you, Lord God, in song and standing beneath the, the teaching of your word, I pray, Lord, that every heart would be drawn closer to you, Lord, that you would speak to each one of us, dear God, and change us more into the image of Christ. We ask this, Lord, in Christ's name. For his sake we pray. Amen. Now Jacob dwelt in the land where his father was a stranger, in the land of Canaan. The geographical area known as Canaan was the namesake of Noah's grandson. Canaan was the grandson that Noah cursed in Genesis 9, 24, after Ham, the father of Canaan, exposed Noah's nakedness. The Canaanites were historically a wicked people, and God constantly warned his people about getting too close to them and being influenced by their evil ways. The land of Canaan was the land that God had promised to Abraham and to his descendants. That promise is found in Genesis 17, verses 6 through 8. The promise was confirmed to Abraham's son Isaac in Genesis 26, 3, and then to Isaac's son Jacob in Genesis 28, 13. So God promised them the land of Canaan but that promise was not to be realized immediately. Jacob's father dwelt in that land not as an owner, but as a stranger. It would take hundreds of years before Jacob's descendants would finally take possession of Canaan, the promised land. There would be many hardships and tribulations that would have to be overcome before possession of the promised land will be realized. The promised land is a picture of the Christian life. It's a picture of the life that we as believers live. The promised land was given to the Israelites, and it was a good land. It was filled with milk and honey. But in order to enjoy the fruit of the land, the people had to walk in obedience to God. The land also had to be conquered. There were enemies that needed to be defeated in order to enjoy the possession of the land. Isn't that like the Christian life? God has given us a beautiful life in Christ, but if we refuse to walk in obedience we will be miserable in our Christian life. Our walk in Christ is not a walk that is unopposed. We are opposed daily by the world, the flesh, and the devil. If we fail to walk in the spirit, then we are easily overcome 
by our flesh and sinful desires. Verse 2, this is the history of Jacob. Jacob's history, we've been studying Jacob's life. His history started out as an ambitious young man and conniving. And that, of course, resulted in him being threatened by his brother and necess necessitating his departure from his home and having to go to live with his uncle Laban in Uncle Laban's home. At Uncle Laban's, he was treated as a hired servant, and he was cheated constantly. Due to Uncle Laban's conniving, Jacob acquired two wives when he only desired one, Rachel. And having two wives who competed with one another regarding childbearing resulted in Jacob acquiring two more wives. So Jacob left Laban with his four wives and 12 children in tow, 11 sons and one daughter. Jacob experienced good times and bad times. The purity of Jacob's daughter was taken from her by a foreigner in the land which they lived. Some of Jacob's sons responded to that by deceiving and slaughtering all of the men of Shechem and taking their women and all of their goods into captivity. Jacob's oldest son, Reuben, disrespected his father by having intercourse with one of Jacob's wives, Bilhah. Finally, Jacob's beloved Rachel died, giving birth to Jacob's 12th son, Benjamin. The history of Jacob to this point is similar to the history of every servant of God. We all experience good times and hard times, but through it all, God is faithful. God is dependable. God never leaves us nor forsakes us like he has promised us in his word. From here on, the history of Jacob or Israel will go through the young man that we are studying tonight, Joseph. Joseph's story will dominate our remaining 14 chapters of Genesis. Our text continues, Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brothers, and the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to his father. Now, the first thing that enters into my mind when I read this passage is a question. Why are we informed that Joseph was with the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah? Dan and Naphtali were the sons of Bilhah, and they were sons number five and six. Gad and Asher were the sons of Zilpah, and they were sons number seven and eight. Joseph is son number 11. So why isn't he hanging out with sons 9 and 10? I mean, they're closer to his age. It seems that there's a division in the family based on parentage. Because you see, sons 9 and 10, Esaichar and Zebulun, are the sons of Leah, just like sons 1, 2, 3, and 4. So they're all hanging together. The sons of the concubines are hanging together. And then there's Joseph. Benjamin doesn't play a role yet. He's still too young. It's a sign of a dysfunctional family. There are factions within the family. Continuing in our text, it says, Joseph brought a bad report of them to his father. It seems that them taking Joseph in and hanging out with them wasn't enough to convince Joseph to let what they were doing slide. We're not told what they did, 
But I am pretty certain that they weren't happy that whatever it was was reported back to their, their father. Verse 3, now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age. Also, he made him a tunic of many colors. Here we see another indicator of dysfunction in his family. I understand that Jacob, as the head of the household, would have a hard time bringing harmony to this disparate group. But that was Jacob's job as the head of the family. Jacob had the responsibility of showing all of his wives that he loved them and that they were valuable and that they had no need to compete with one another. Jacob had the responsibility to love all of his children equally and discipline them fairly. And Jacob failed at all of these things. Now, I can understand having greater emotion for one person over another, even if it is your children. There are certain personalities that we naturally mesh with and we feel more of a kinship with. That's called emotion. That's natural. And that's okay. But love is not merely emotion. Love is also a choice. God loves us, not based on sappy emotion, but because God chose to love us. 1 John 4, 7 and 8 says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Love is a choice. Jacob should have chose to love all of his children equally. As I was spending quiet time with the Lord this morning, before we had corporate prayer, in our Zoom meeting, I was thinking about how I love. How is my love expressed? And how does my love vary from person to person? As I examined myself, I came to the unfortunate realization that the love that I am most proud of with God being an exception, of course, is the love that I express for my grandchildren. I'm so patient and so loving with those children. I speak to them with kindness and gentleness and love, even when I correct them. And, and children that are three and a half years old and younger, they will get on your nerves. They will ask you the same question a million times and I'll answer them a million times. I'm just patient with them. I love them so much. I, when I correct them, it breaks my heart. And I do correct them. Why do I correct them? Because I love them. If I were to not discipline my children, the Bible says that is a form of hatred, right? You can have that emotion for your children but if that emotion overrides your discipline, you're not loving your children. You're being like Jacob. You're choosing over emotion over the choice to love. And the choice to love requires discipline. But when I discipline those children, I'm talking to them, I'm explaining to them. If you keep doing that, Papa's going to have to discipline you. And you're not going to like it. I, I, I don't want to discipline you. So let's do the right thing. So you don't have to go through. And if I have to go to that point where I need to spank their bottom, it's breaking my heart, right? Because I love them so much. And I'm proud of that love, right? I'm totally impressed. I'm like, man, you, you, are, you make a great father, right? My children was like, where was this guy when we were growing up, right? I mean, I was a good father, but I wasn't a great father. 
Not like that. So I evaluated my actions toward them and the way I expressed my love for them, and I was totally impressed with myself. But I didn't break my arm patting myself on the back because at the same time I was impressed with myself, I was convicted. Do I treat my wife as well as I treat them? And the answer was a resounding no. I don't always speak to my wife with the same tenderness that I speak to them with. I'm not always as patient with my wife as I am with them. Why? Because my wife is an adult? Because I have certain expectations of my wife? Because my wife being an adult and being an expert on me knows how to press my buttons when she wants to? None of that matters. I am commanded to love my wife. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. As a believer, of course, we are to love God preeminently. He is first. When Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment, this is what he said in Matthew 22, 37. Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. God is to be preeminent. But if you are a believer and you are married, the next person in line is your spouse. If you are treating anyone better than your spouse, I don't care if it's your children, your grandchildren, or anyone else, then you need to repent. I repent it. Because if you're treating anyone better than your spouse, then your home needs some repair. It may not be as broken as Jacob's was, but if you're not loving your spouse in this way, being number one in your life, because you and your spouse are one, the Bible tells us if you don't dwell with knowledge of your spouse, then that affects your prayers. It hinders your prayers. That spouse needs to be Number one in your life. And if he or she is not, I implore you to repent and get right with God immediately. I know I repent, right? Does that mean I'm going to be perfect? If you think that, you obviously don't know me, right? Of course, I'm going to mess up. But having that in mind, the objective then you repent again, and you get right, and you realize, no, I stepped out. This is the target. My wife needs to be treated better than these precious little babies. My wife needs to be preeminent. So does your wife or your husband. We're to love God first, then our spouse, and then everyone else. And the last person on that list is guess who? yourself. You're last on that list. You love everyone else before you love yourself. Jesus demonstrated that he lived his life for others, not himself. Jacob not only had greater feelings for Joseph, Jacob expressed those feelings in his actions by giving Joseph this beautiful coat that act left no doubt in anyone's mind that Joseph was the favorite. And this coat that he gave Joseph, our understanding is it, it, it was longer than the regular coat. It went all the way down to the wrist and all the way down to the ankles, meaning it wasn't a workman's coat. This was a coat of nobility and prestige. Joseph would have this coat on and he would be strutting. You know, and everybody would know, oh, man, that's the favorite. Look at verse 4. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. Joseph is tremendously loved by his father, but he is hated by his brothers. 
They couldn't even speak peaceably to him. You know, this is something that I have witnessed in my life, and maybe you have too. I like to say that when you overcome with love for someone, they can do no wrong. If you're married, you probably remember a certain period when you were dating your spouse, right? When you're in that, that la-la land and you can't, you're blind. You can't see anything that's wrong. They can do no wrong. That is one end of the spectrum. But unfortunately, I have seen relationships devolve to the point to the other end of the spectrum where there is so much hatred and so much bitterness. It doesn't matter what that person does or what comes out of their mouth. It's met with ugliness and hatred. That is ungodliness. Ungodliness. What's the solution for that? Repentance. Repentance. If a believer is in that state for, with anyone, then you need to humble yourself before God. Submit yourself to God and God's word in order to bring honor to God with your life and your actions. This ungodliness is what dominated Joseph's brothers. Verse 5, now Joseph had a dream, and he told it to his brothers, and they hated him even more. So he said to them, please, Hear this dream which I have dreamed. There we were binding sheaves in the field. Then behold, my sheaf arose and also stood upright. And indeed, your sheaves stood all around and bowed down to my sheaf. And his brother said to him, shall you indeed reign over us? Or shall you indeed have dominion over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams. And for his words, there's a lot of hate going on right here, right? I mean, I don't know if Joseph isn't picking up on social cues, you know, or what. But his brothers are definitely not appreciating what they're hearing. I don't really see arrogance in Joseph. Maybe it's there. I don't know. But I do see a lack of sensitivity. Joseph is so caught up in what this dream means to himself. He is not taking into account how the hearers would feel about this. Oh, man, guess what? I had this dream, you know? What do you want his brother to say? Oh, man, good for you. One day we're going to be bowing down to you, Joseph. Solid. They hate Joseph. Verse 9. Then he dreams still another dream. And told it to his brothers and said, look, I have dreamed another dream. And this time the sun, the moon, and the 11 stars bowed down to me. So he told it to his father and his brothers. And his father rebuked him and said to him, what is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall your mother and I and your brothers indeed come to bow down to the earth before you? And his brothers envied him. But his father kept the matter in mind. Joseph probably isn't showing a whole lot of wisdom here. These dreams are obviously from God, but maybe these dreams were just for Joseph, right? But he, he's sharing them, and, and his father rebukes him because the interpretation of these dreams are obvious. And his father says, what? You think your mother and I are going to bow down to you as well? But it says that he, he kept the matter in the back of his head, right? I understand that. I do that a lot, right? I, I, I'm a former intelligence officer, so I deal in facts, and I get information from all kinds of sources and everything. I can't verify everything that I hear, so what I do is I just collect all these things, and I just keep them. I just keep them in my mind right, till you get corroborating information. And that's what Jacob is doing here. He, he, he rebukes him, but he, he's thinking, you know what? There might be something about this. So he keeps it in his mind, and it says that his brothers, it doesn't say that they hate him. On this instance, 
they envy him. Maybe they see as well that this is something that might be divine, and this might actually happen. So now there's hatred combined with envy. Verse 12, then his brothers went to feed their father's flock in Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, are not your brothers feeding the flock in Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. So he said to him, here I am. Here we get a great glimpse into Joseph's character. If you are a parent to a child who is at least a toddler or older, then you no doubt have told your child to do something only to get defiance or reluctance. The younger ones are pretty direct. They'll just tell you no, right to your face, no. Or they'll ignore you, or they'll throw a fit. As they get older, the signs get a little bit more subtle. You tell them to do something, you get smacking of the lips. The rolling of the eyes or the sigh of the, oh, man, right? But Joseph didn't do any of that. He simply responded, here I am. It reminds me of Isaiah 6, 8. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, here am I. Send me. Joseph is an obedient son. He wants to do what his father wants him to do. Maybe this is another reason that Jacob loved him more. Verse 14, then he said to him, please go and see if it is well with your brothers and well with the flocks and bring back word to me. So he sent him out of the valley of Hebron and he went to Shechem. Now a certain man found him and there he was wandering in the field. And the man asked him saying, what are you seeking? So he said, I am seeking my brothers. Please tell me where they are feeding their flocks. And the man said, they have departed from here, for I heard them say, let us go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them in Dothan. Another look at the character of Joseph. Joseph is intent on completing the task that he was given. Although he didn't find his brother in Shechem, he continued to seek them. Once he heard he, they were in Dothan, he went there. And Dothan was about 10 to 15 miles west of Shechem. Verse 18, now when they saw him afar off, even before he came near them, they conspired against him to kill him. Then they said to one another, look, this dreamer is coming. Just seeing Joseph in the distance inspired that hatred, right? They, they, so they saw him. They probably saw that colorful coat, right, in the distance. Uh-oh. Here he comes. Here comes that dreamer. Verse 20, come therefore, let us now kill him and cast him into some pit, and we shall say, some wild beast has devoured him. We shall see what will become of his dreams. They're conspiring to kill their brother. Remember, they hated him and they envied him. They may have thought that maybe this dream is of God, but how is God going to accomplish this dream if we kill him? Right? They, they even come up with their backstory. Right? We'll, we'll say that a wild beast devoured him. 1 John 2.11 says this, but he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. He who hates his brother is in darkness. These men have allowed their emotion to take them to a place of darkness, a place that we should never allow ourselves to go. To hate one's brother is a serious act of wickedness, whether it be a natural brother 
or a spiritual brother. Jesus commanded us that we should even love our enemies. Matthew 5, 43 through 44 says, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. We are not to hate our brother. We are not to hate anyone. We are even to love our enemies. Jesus tells us that we are to pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Just as Jesus did. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Verse 21, but Reuben heard it, and he delivered him out of their hands and said, let us not kill him. And Reuben said to them, shed no blood, but cast him into this pit, which is in the wilderness, and do not lay a hand on him, that he might deliver him out of their hands and bring him back to his father. Reuben had a mind to save Joseph. Reuben is the oldest. He is in charge, and he does not want to be guilty of his brother's murder. Verse 23, so it came to pass when Joseph had come to his brothers that they stripped Joseph of his tunic, the tunic of many colors that was on him. Then they took him and cast him into a pit, and the pit was empty. There was no water in it. Can you imagine this scene? Joseph is doing the will of his father, and all of a sudden his brothers take him by force and strip off his clothes. He's crying out to them, and they throw him into this pit. I would imagine that Joseph's life has been one of being coddled. This is probably the first major tr uh, trial of Joseph's life. Joseph has been given the best of what Jacob's had, and he has wanted for nothing. Now he has been stripped of his clothes and deprived of his freedom. And the worst part of this is that it's at the hands of his very own brothers. Look at verse 25. And they sat down to eat a meal. What tremendous callousness of heart. They just stripped their brother. They were planning on killing him. They've thrown him in a pit, and they still got an appetite. Took care of that problem. Let's eat. I'm hungry. Last Wednesday, in my absence, Pastor Todd taught Jonah chapter 1. Jonah was on a ship with a bunch of men that were worshiping other gods. They didn't even know anything about the true God until Jonah told them about him. And yet those men, even though Jonah was identified as the cause of the life-threatening storm that they were in, and even told them, throw me overboard if you want to live. They still didn't want to throw Jonah overboard. They rolled and rolled against the storm. But they ended up having no choice. And they cried out to God, don't fault us for this man's blood. Those men were better than these men, Joseph's brothers. These men are doing this tremendously wicked act. But there is redemption. These men will eventually be redeemed. And a great part of that redemption will be because of Joseph. The life of Joseph will give us pictures of our Lord Jesus Christ over and over and over and over again as we study that. I look at how wicked and callous these men are. And then I remember that the Bible says in Revelation that these guys are going to be sitting on 12 thrones. <laughs> 12 thrones, along with the 12 apostles. That is 
redemption. God doesn't give up on us. Could be as wicked as these guys are demonstrating, and there's still redemption in the Lord Jesus Christ. Continuing our text, then they lifted their eyes and looked, and there was a company of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels, bearing spices, balm, and myrrh, on their way to carry them down to Egypt. So Judah said to his brothers, what profit is there if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come and let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother and our flesh. And his brothers, listen, Joseph's life is going to be spared, but he's about to become a slave. They're not going to kill him. They're going to sell their brother into slavery. Joseph is about to become someone's property. Now, the things that are happening to Joseph are obviously evil, but God's hand is on it. God is using the evil choices of these brothers to accomplish his will while not allowing their evil to go too far. Verse 28. Then Midianite traders passed by, so the brothers pulled Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver, and they took Joseph to Egypt. They took Joseph. They took Joseph from the coat that he was wearing, this coat of nobility and royalty, They stripped him down, and they sold him into slavery for pieces of silver. It reminds me of a king who himself stepped off his throne and laid aside his robes of glory and humbled himself to become a slave, a servant of mankind, and to offer his blood for me. Joseph will typify the life of Christ over and over again. We want to remember that when God allows evil into our lives, he has a purpose. And it is God's hand that will stay evil. It's God's hand that will say, so far and no further than this. And sometimes in our lives, it may be even the ones that are closest to us that cause the evil that we have to go through. And we are to respond in love, even in those cases. But we need to be careful that we aren't the ones that are doing the evil. Jesus loved his disciples. He walked with them. He taught them. He cared for them for three years. And one of his very own disciples betrayed him of his own free will. And the Bible tells us that It would have been good if he had never been born. So we don't want to be the one that causes others evil. We want to be the ones that love as Jesus loves. We want to be the ones that walk in righteousness. We want to be the ones that put others before ourselves. As the Bible tells us to love one another, and prefer one another in love. That's the message of our text tonight, and that is what God wants us to do. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you, Lord God, for your word. We thank you, Lord God, as we embark on the life of Joseph, that there are so many tremendous lessons for us to learn as we follow the life of this man, Lord, that you have caused to be a type 
and a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we ask, God, that we would emulate all of the good that we see in our text tonight and that we would eschew all of the evil that we saw. Lord God, where we need to repent, let us repent. And Lord, in the areas that we are excelling, let us excel even more by your grace and your mercy and by your love. For we know, Lord, that in ourselves, in our flesh, there dwells no good thing, but in you, Lord Jesus Christ, we can allow you to use us for your glory and to do great and wonderful and mighty things. So, Father, have your way with us, dear God. Lord, if there's any that are listening to this message, God, that does not know you as Savior. At this time, Lord God, open their hearts to receive you. If you're listening to this message and you don't know Jesus and his spirit is speaking to you, I want to implore you to just simply open your heart and surrender your life to him. Surrender. Surrender. There's nothing you can do to earn your salvation. There's nothing you can barter for. There's no goodness that you have that God desires. God wants you simply to surrender and receive his free gift of salvation. All you need to do is be willing to turn over your life to Jesus and give up your sin, and God does the rest. That is what's called faith. If you have that faith, then God will welcome you into his family. For he says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for each and every soul that has heard it. Let us go forth and spread your gospel, Lord God, because the time is short. We love you and we praise you. So dismiss us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you for coming and staying despite of the heat. Lord willing, everything will be fixed and great on Sunday, and it'll be frigid in here. God bless. Have a good night.